Tonight, we are going to feature Ionola Woods, 13 St. Lucian poets. 13, one, three. Now, many of you fear number 13, but the director of this poetry festival is fearless. So we have 13 St. Lucian poets. And um, to make it worse, one of them, well, I watch a lot of horror movies, you know, and there's always a vampire. And the vampire is always called Vlad. And one of the 13 poets here tonight is actually called Vlad. So it seems we have 12 poets and a vampire. So watch out, ladies. Luckily, today isn't Friday the 13th. So I'd like to recognize here tonight, we have the mayor of the Grosley constituency, Mr. Egbert Lucien. We have the partner of Sir Derek Walcott, Ms. Sigrid Nama. We have people who have been people. <laughs> I see people who are still people. I see has-beens. I see people who hold current high positions. That is not for me to name them. Okay, so let me do a quick rundown of what the Nobel Laureate Festival in Grosile has to offer still. So tonight we are here with our 13 poets. Tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning, the schools in District 1, that's Grosile area, from Cap to shock and beyond, they will be hosting a poetry festival. So it will begin at 9.30 in the morning right here at the same venue. And on Friday, this one is really, really big. It's a dance production choreographed by an award-winning son of the Grosley soil, Richard Ambrose, and it is dubbed One Friday Night. So while some people will be down the road enjoying the spirit of St. Lucia, others will be in here enjoying one Friday night. And on the 31st of January, there will be a book launch here. Mr. Sylvester Closel has written a book on sustainable tourism and the launch will be right here. But before that, on Sunday, the 29th of January, our very own Taj Wicks, he will hold the final of his song competition, and it will happen right here. And this is happening Sunday, January 29th, from 2 in the afternoon. So everybody, please turn out in large numbers to support and celebrate our two Nobel laureates whose birthdays yesterday. So we are here to prove that the pen is mighty indeed. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I hand you over to the director of this evening's production, the award-winning, the one and only, Kendall Hippolyte. Thanks, Linda. Um, blessings, everyone. Um, we should be kind of starting behind time, so we're going to move into things pretty quickly. Um, but first off, before we go into the reason for our gathering here tonight, I want to just recognize briefly that a, a giant tree has fallen. Um, Yves Renard, who is a climate justice warrior, who is a community organizer of notes, who is an intellectual thinker, visionary, 
who was involved in so many areas of St. Lucian cultural life, um, and elsewhere in the Caribbean too, you know, in, in, um, in Haiti, um, in Jamaica, in other places. He did so, so, so much. Um, and a global citizen, and yet at the same time, really deeply rooted in Labry. Um, he was, what, what can I say? I, I know what else to say, honestly. But I want to recognize his passing with one minute of silence. If we may all stand briefly for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we go to, um, we gather there, and we go to have a kind of a conversation in a weird way, although you don't necessarily have to say much. Um, a conversation between the poets and, and your wonderful selves. Um, first of all, I think I, I want to make it very, very clear that the 13 poets who are here tonight are by no means a complete representation of the poetic tradition in St. Lucia, not at all. Um, there are a number of poets, plenty of them, um, whose work forms a, a substantial part of the poetic tradition here, but they're not here tonight and their work is not represented here tonight. Um, to do that would require a slate of events over a period of days. In fact, it would require a literary festival. Um, and among those not being heard here tonight are um, some persons who have published work of their, of their you know, individual, individual volumes, um, and there are people like Adrian Auger, Patricia Turnbull, who is here with us tonight, fortunately, but not performing. Adrian Auger, Patricia Turnbull, Hazel Simmons, Melania Daniel, Morris Downs, Alicia Velas, Morgan Dalfinist, and, and there are others. And then, in addition to those who have their own their work published in individual volumes, they're poets who don't have individual volumes published, but they have had their work in anthologies and journals, both, both here in St. Lucia in the Caribbean, out in the wider world. You know? We speak of persons like Irvin Desi, Marcian Jopier, Yasmin Odlum, Catherine Esther Cowie, and so on, so on. It goes on. You know? um, and in the case of spoken word, because those are published poets we're speaking about. In the case of spoken word, and the spoken word thing is the thing I have some um, issues with. I'm not, I don't mean I'm against it, I just mean it needs to be debated. You know? um, there are other persons who have established a tradition of spoken word here. Um, and I, you know, like um, um, Ethan Fletcher, Black Crayon, Stephen Dantes, I Shine, Lisa Dublin, Kermel Lisset. The list goes on. They've established a tradition of spoken word, and we'll see examples of spoken word here tonight. And there's a very, very fruitful discussion to be had about the place of spoken word, whatever you know, in in our in our tradition. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is to draw attention first of all to the work that's been going on here, to establish some things about the kind of tradition that that Derek Walcott had helped to consolidate here um, and give some indication of how persons fit um, into that tradition. Um, the idea of a, of a poetic tradition, I mean, especially in a country which has a Nobel, you know, Nobel Prize winning poet, may suggest the image of like a, a river, you know, going with 
tributaries flowing off it and so on, like a linear thing. Um, I'm not so sure that that is the best representation of the tradition that we have here. Some traditions, yeah, you can point to you know, your one absolute ancestor poet, another person's following, sometimes even with similarities of style and so on. Um, I'm not sure that accurately represents what we have. You know? um, it feels to me as though what we have is like, like a kind of a coral bed, you know, a coral bed, the foundation of a coral bed that, that Derek created. And coming up in that coral bed are uh, other bits of coral, other, other, other poets, you know, um, with their own, their own ways, their own styles, very, 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 very regated in the, in the choices that they make about poetic devices and the choices that they make about what they, how they say what they want to say. But it's a coral bed and everyone is in it and is nourished by that original, that, 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 that original, that, sorry, nourished by that original, I'm not even sure what the word is, um, that, that, that Derek has created for us. There's a way in which Derek has, and then that became clear to me when I visited the Caribbean Islands. There's a way in which Derek has made the idea of being a poet such a normal thing, such a natural thing. And I think we've all benefited from this. Um, so these poets do what poets have always done in their own ways. They explore the self and they explore the society. They explore the society, they explore the self, you know, back and forth. Um, Vlad and um, Vladimir Lucien in his, um, in his lecture last week, spoke about how you know, the, the in and out, what you are inside, kind of shapes to some extent what you see outside, but what you see outside impacts what you are inside, and then that in turn kind of like, you know, um, helps to condition what you see outside. Uh, it got very, very wonderfully confusing, um, and I think that's, that's great, that's partly about how, it, how it's supposed to be. But the, the, the poets here tonight, their work, their work does that. Um, so one of the things that the, the another thing that, that the poets have in common here is the commitment to shaping the word. Uh, we call it craft, technique, um, you know, poetic construction, all kinds of ways of referring to it. And Walcott was an absolute master and an avatar and really, really tough about the, the necessity for persons to commit to the craft of the world. And I think we'll be seeing persons here tonight who, in their different styles, in their different ways, have committed to the craft of the world. Something else that we'll be seeing tonight, too, I think, is the way in which a number of the various ideas and concerns and issues that Derek engaged with are still continuing. It's still coming up in these poets' work. Not because persons are trying to imitate, necessarily, but because these ideas and concerns are still relevant, they've not been necessarily fully you know, uh, explored and plunged into and dealt with. You know? um, ideas and, and this is like cultural identity and the clash of traditional values and, and a, a materialistic model of development, and the richness and the beauty and yet the fragility of, of the folk tradition, um, threats to the environment, the love of homeland, the, uh, the reverential love of nature, that, that is so much a part of Derek, that is here tonight too. Um, the beauty and complexity of relationships and, and therefore of the self. All these themes idea, are being shared with us here tonight. So what I'll be doing very briefly in between the poems uh, is simply drawing our attention after each poet has, has engaged you, simply drawing our attention to sometimes where these ideas and, and concerns uh, have come up um, and sometimes trying to relate it to how all this fits back into the tradition, into this foundation coral bed that we're all part of. Um, so we'll begin with the, the same foundation, which is the interaction between poets and the cultural heritage that they're nourished by. And in this, Derek was an amazing example. And so I will begin with this example. Amai la di wai, di wai o ko, 
Diwai Dudu Diwai Zuzu Mama Ella Diwai Mama Ella Diwai My country heart I am not home till Sesen sings A voice with wood smoke and ground doves in it that cracks like clay on a road whose tints are the dry seasons, whose quattros tighten my heartstrings. The shak shaks rattle like cicadas under the fur leaved nettles of childhood. An old fence at noon, Bele, quadrille, la comète, gracious turns until the light settles. A voice, like rain on a hot road, a smell of cut grass, its language as small as the cedars and sweeter than any wherever I have gone. That makes my right hand Ishmael, my guide, the star-fingered Frangipani. Our kings and queens march to a floral rain, wooden swords of the rose and the marguerite, the chorus, the lances of feathered reeds, ochre cliffs and soft comas, bright as drizzling banjos, becoming rain, and the drizzle going back to Guinea, trailing her hem like, like a country dancer. Shadows across the plain of you fought with her voice. Small grazing herds of horses shine from a passing cloud. I see them in broken sunlight, like singers remembering the words of a dying language. I watch the bright wires follow Sesen's singing, sunlight in fading rain, and the names of rivers whose bridges I used to look. Now my laddie was, was. So to continue this conversation that we've begun, I will call on the first person. I'm not doing biographies of people, but I will call on persons. Um, in, in a chronological order, except for me. I'm, I'm the youngest here, but I've got to be a bit. So <laughs> I will call on persons in a chronological order. So, um, first person I will call on is a person who, more than anyone else, is a direct bridge to, to Derek, um, and that is MacDonald Dixon. Thank you. Go and tell the village it must not change. It must not dream to alter the little penny piece shops smelling of oil, rice, flour, and kerosene. Waiting for a match so the old broken down fire cart can parade down Main Street. For the volunteers to proclaim half in English half Creole, let it burn, Nupani blow, we got no water, all the time surrounded by sea and progress spreading its seeds all over the little place. Go and tell the old woman she must sell the one room wooden shack her mother leave or break it down to make room for glass and wall. Banks hungry for profit will lend any job with collateral to build a mall. The police will stop Marcel selling by the street unless she gets a permit saying sanitized wares costing more than her sales for the whole blighted week. 
profit dead, credit due, funeral same time next week. Go and tell the village, it must not change. And stare the ghetto in the face. The hungry child looking for tough love, looking for mentors. Little boys in empty lots, practicing with Glock and RPGs. That's the price you pay, my friend. The stupidness you start when you put us in glass case and turn us into curios. And pay plain loads of visitors to come and see how we still stupid and how we still damn poor. Second poem, Donkey Beach. Before the stars come from where they come from to shine on my little place. Long before Queen's chain and litanies of laws that tell us nothing but take away the ground from under our foot. Long before canoes reached on the shore to bless this earth, possess this surf with bones that form the dirt that bless the land with fruit. Man was here. We were here. We cannot withdraw when tides withdraw unless red abdicates its complexion, no longer claiming to be the color of blood. Kalinago, African, Indian, all black, mixed in one white shell. Red is the one complexion in all of us. I say this to ask, where you find a right to stop me from praying on my beach, pleading like my ancestors with four day morning to hold back the rain, to make bonfires at sunset, to chase sunfly that will rob me of my right to build my cabin right here on this beach. 600 years, long before Columbus, before back home, an excavator come to dig up my dreams, teeth my sand, ink out my thoughts with seawater, leaving me no grounds for appeal. Man was here. We were here. And my final poem, Beloved Country. I am not for sale, not a single thought, not a pour of sand, not a grain of dirt craving for a teaspoon of lava green or the green bark from a mansion in a tree. Barren, its bark poisons the hell in me. I'm not for sale, not a pinch of flesh, not a yard of wood, not a blanket past ripped from my history book, fearing I rise in some future generation to extract revenge when I remember whips and gasp. I'm not for sale. Not for sacks of gold, not for a traitor's kiss or the ring on Christ's left hand. A politician's smile charms lives, but cannot wave the magic wand. See the self, feel the sun, hear the wind. It's I, it's I. They are not for sale. Not one sugar mill, not this crude sulfur sifting slice of hill. Not a single plume from my bald pitons, fury born in two hemispheres propels my wrath. Come 
like the magi bearing gifts. I am not for sale, not this mixed blood, not my stone chapel opening her doors on empty streets, not I searching for the truth falling from a grandmother's charcoal tongue, cursing soiled faces on investors' bogus bills. I am not for sale, not my sin in locks, not my right to surf on a palm's backside on this curved coast, God's elongated hand. Once I dreamed of kings and fair island cities, regrets now file through the mailbox in my head. Fools will hum this tune, not knowing the song. The conch will blur across this land in verse. Muzzle my poems, grind my art to dust, until, like specks on a Creole loaf, I dazzle sea and sun with sun-parched brilliance. Thank you. There's a poet who has come out fighting, you know, if, if old age is supposed to like calm you down, that did not it. Um, it's a very, very, I mean, all the poems are very, very combative kind of engagement with, with history, you know, and, and it's coming from, among other things, a very, very fierce sense of, of connection to the land. As he says, we were here before all of this, we were here, you know, um, and that's, yeah, that, 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 that sense of our right to be here and, and this is ours. Um, and, and, and a resistance to, to a colonizing influence, whether it be the ancient ones or, or the modern ones. That's in Derek's book as well. That, that, that's something that has continued, because it has to continue, because that's what we face with, you know. Um, the, the language in the poem it always is, is interesting, because like, like some of, of Walcott's work, um, it's, it's written in a kind of, written in a kind of range where, where it can, can go from, 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 from a fairly high register, very, very formal choice of words and so on, into something that is more um, down to earth, idiomatic Creole English, and it can do it you know, um, seamlessly. It, it's, a, it's a goal that um, Derek had set himself, um, I think, from fairly early. And by the time he had gone to the school of flight, he had achieved that, he had achieved that kind of suppleness of, of language that could fly high and come down low and still sound natural. You know, so it's again, I'm just, I'm just kind of flagging how the tradition is continuing, both in terms of the ideas in it and in terms of styles, you know, that, that um, Okay, so, um, all that said, I would like to go um, down the line and bring on the next person. Um, again, no biography, uh, but there's, there's, a, there's an ongoing, fascinating relationship between the next person coming and McDonald was on before them. It's, it's a pleasure watching them in action, in combative action. I'd like to call on John Lord Lee. Come again to narrow lanes of Belmont, sat in the King's Halls of Cambridge, re entered Marshall, walked with laureates in Boston, Stockholm, Castries, climbed hills of shanties above Fort de France, swam in Skeetsville, Barbados, drank over late night fish on Baxter's Road, Bridgetown. Laughed with reggae stars and Kaizo kings, strode pagodas in Tokyo, temples in Kyoto, and prayed in simple pews of village churches. Love 
has left wrinkled skins of loneliness. Children gone to far countries as they must. Lovers distracted by diversions of age and old flames rekindling dead wood. What remains to be sung, made poetry of, of all those gone so quickly hours? All of it, I guess. That voyage of a life. If you are brave enough to find metaphors of the metaphysical in it, in all the messy stuff, the sacred and sacramental in certain failures, in bird call insisting, insisting, pup saying something to a goat in the yard, compa music coming up the hill, child shrieking somewhere in a house, and so on, all of it there in your present timeline, in your hearing now, now threading that life and its inebriated days, your weary hunger for affection, for affirmation, your shifty-eyed hope of faith, of redemption, years inevitably winding in their spiral to that moment of the epilogue of your biography. So, write it down and say it like a Kaizo Grio, like Stalin or Shadow, sing it strong, like a chanteur over shak shak drums and violo, like Bob Marley still wailing from passing vans over the lost cities of yards. After poems, psalms, and sacred canticles that hymn the divine presence in which we dance gracious quadrille to the scratchy violon, mandolin, shak shak and goatskin drum, women in the alluring mystery of their warped yet, men careful with their feet, Poems so often forget the dancer of creation laughing in the brown mud of our genesis. But I have trusted in your mercy and sought the sacramental of my days in the archetypal scissor-tailed gull circling above sibilant surf, in Casuarina's needle-lead curtsies before the breeze of angels' wings off a hill, in elegant spider lilies under my crotons, in the trusting gaze of the chained pup, within the perfect mastery of your sun, settling its stained glass saints and evening offerings on the horizon's altar. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, with blues and laments like Nina Simone's of strange fruit, with Marley's reggae to get up, stand up to the wicked man, with shadow and rudder waving the high mass, Patrick saint Emeline Michel, Florita Marquis, and clay-voiced multitudes choiring out of their psalter. Among dancers, players of instruments loud, we make psalms of our living before your throne, all of it. Permutations and combinations of joy, heartache, aging, and diurnal boredom. I will sing to the Lord yesterday, today, and tomorrow in lines and images from your overwhelming creation, in mantras and rhythms from globes, maps, clocks of earth and galaxies, 
of the simplicity of God, of his holy sovereignty, in whose unity we are one diversity, of the poems, songs. I raise chantings of faith in the great I am with cantors of the tabernacles of the holy mystery because he has dealt bountifully with I and I. These old people don't joke, you know. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's, there, there's a number of different strands going, going for this. You know, we, we're not doing any kind of literary academic exploration, but still, it's, it's just wise to note some of the stuff that's going on in there, you know. That it's, and the poems are, among other things, exploring aging, you know, and aging, aging with a sense of acceptance and, and, and balance. Um, and that's something that, that became stronger and stronger in, in Derek's work from midsummer onwards, by the time he got to the final egrets. Um, it's very much there in that, that poem of his that has, has kind of a worldwide popularity, love after love, you know, that, that sense of acceptance, you're looking, you're looking back over a long life and you, you, you accept it with, with gratitude. You know? um, that's, that, that, that's there in, in what Robbie is doing. Um, and, and again, like 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 Nixon, like Nixon's work, yeah, there's Robbie's um, his his word choices, his his kind of his kind of vocabulary choices, um, structures allow for a, a movement of from you know, very very grand language and you know and grand imagery, and into something that's more down to earth and basic, and to to move in and out of that. You know, um, that that is part of it. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our tradition as Caribbean people, actually. Um, but we're we seeing it here um, in the poetry. Um, something that's been burning on me more and more over the years is that for, for a while now, um, Robert has been using music motifs. He's been referring to music, he's been referring to styles of music, um, you know, um, con you know con country music, um, traditional folk, um, urban music, reggae, um, calypso, and so on. He's been doing that and, and reaching beyond that too. You know? um, and um, and not not just within the Anglophone Caribbean, but within the Frank within the Francophone Caribbean as well. He mentions particular artists like Emily and Michelle and so on. And for a place like Seth Lucia, which has that dual heritage, that perspective that he has, uh, and, and that, that looking out on on, on music, uh, it makes sense coming from a place like here. That that's, that he has that perspective. Um, he uses the image of music of, of, of folk dance, um, new folk dress. To, to praise the divine presence. Um, Robert is a, is a deeply religious poet, you know? Um, but that, that, that praise, that deeply religious praise, is brought over to us in our own cultural garb, so to speak. You know? um, he, he uses imagery of, of dance, of dancing before, or of coming in a procession um, of, 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 the, of, the, of the, the folk dances, the widow van, the lacomet, you know, going up and dancing before God. Um, and there's a, a deep reverence for nature that goes on in his work as well. Um, and that, there's something interesting that's happening here because Derek too had a, a deep reverence for nature, deep, 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 spiritual. Um, Robert's reverence for nature is, is, goes, his expression of it goes more directly to Christian religious imagery, you know, um, that's that's not where Derek is coming from directly, um, mm -hmm. but that that all that that sense of a divine presence in yeah in, in in the in the manifestations of nature in rivers and trees and so on and so on is there in both of them. So that's that's yet another stream that's 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 continuing. That's 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 more of that same kind of coral that's growing um, in Robert's work. Um, by, by the end, by, by the time we came to the end of those pieces, um, it kind of like zooms out almost from, from the cultural thing and, 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 the, and the landscape of a particular country, it kind of zooms out into something like almost like cosmic and, and the language is more overtly biblical. You know? um, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't know that there is 
the another poet in our tradition who is doing quite what he does. Um, there, there are indications of it, strands of it in different persons, but in his, in his, in his, um, yeah, his work, it takes a poet like, like Robert to say something like, after poems, psalms, or after poetry, psalms, and to say that with a, a complete conviction, with a, a straightforward truthfulness. You have to be, you have to be embedded in a certain kind of life and a set of values for you to say that with absolute belief. So, um, yeah, it's, I love our tradition. It's got so much, so much going on in it. So, um, thanks, Robbie. Um, I'd like to call on someone else who is doing really, really interesting work. He's a um, classmate of mine. Like I said, I'm not doing biography. And I'm glad he's, he's always written, uh, but it's later in his life um, that that work has begun to, to come out and we've begun to see what kind of bits of coral that he's, he's um, bringing up from the coral bed. I call on George Goddard. My first poem this evening, ladies and gentlemen, Messieurs, Mesdames, is titled, If I Had Thought. If I had thought you would have gone so imperceptibly, so almost without my knowing, I might have listened to your fluted love, the two twelves in the orange grove, more intently, I would have dipped more easily in your island streams, savoring the cool ripple of your fingers on my skin. I would have slept late into an afternoon to wake to the banter and squawking of acres mating in a stand of blue mangroves, oblivious of this progress thing about to happen. I would have painted immortally children bathing, swathed in clear rain, coming down over La Sorcier. But now the sun dips into an evening, red with the dust of the trades, and I note that we have traded the soft tenor of two twelves the pure pleasure of rain on a child's skin for this time. Moving now, not to the cadence of the spawning season of virgin fish or the stilted probing of one blue heron in a river ebbing measures the intractable clatter of komatsus, a small crab ferreted from the tidal slush, protests the bird speaking. The futility of her placards matched only by her ignorance. She hasn't heard of the rivers dying, her demise, their imminence. But Les Mals away were aptly named for hardly hearing or hardly listening like those who loudly proclaim new paradigms that rise beyond the trees, until one does not hear from cubicle perches the two twelves complaint, the silence of cedars no longer speaking, tractors backfill wetlands to fulfill other dreams, ours sleep late, to wake to a nightmare that does not end, mangroves falling, the high rising arrogance of condominiums, machines keep on coming, and time shares share none of our dreams. Messieurs, Mesdames, qui pièce poésie ça là me caillé actuellement? C'est en créole. Et après moi, il y a en créole, 
on a traduit en anglais aussi. Titre, titre pièce ça là, c'est des chansons de l'amour. Mais moi quand il y a une chanson tout seul. Alors, des chansons de l'amour. Restez tranquille du moins. Si la peine dans nos yeux ou caille dissipé. Si douleur dans notre chair ou caille disparaît. Moi je caille à vous doué ma chair ou pas te caille parler. Ou te caille simplement rester tranquille. Et tu miettes pas tu miettes. Ou peut venir réaliser que moi qu'a gardé à sou et moi qu'a souhaité ou en la vie qui a déroulé à la fin, à dans la paix et avec la joie. Parce que tristesse là où qu'a porté notre cœur, ce n'est pas un chai qui est absolument léger, ou bien un croix qui est zéti du moins pour supporter. Et il ne peut pas obliger pour chaye. Ou ni mérite zèle en ange, comme un ange, ou protégé. And now, English translation, two songs of love. Stay calm, dear one, if the hurt in your eyes will dissipate, if the pain in your heart will evanesce. I would wish, dear one, you would not speak. You would simply be still, and little by little, you may come to understand that I am watching over you, and I am wishing you a life to ultimately unfold peacefully and with joy, because the sadness you carry within is not a burden that is light by any means, or a cross that's easy to bear, my love, and there is no need to carry it. You need the overarching wings of an angel to shield you, to protect you. And now, Ladies and gentlemen, this piece is called Lines at Kazamba. Lines at Kazamba. Do it in this clear eyed light. Now that you know that your back's against imponderable walls, do it in the day breaking light of these times because you can no longer retreat on the rocks. Do it where the water washes the shore that assuages your feet, where the sacred offerings of ancestors lie, and the ground exudes this ethos, who we are, whom they have denied that we be. Just do it and reclaim this space, or else the night falls unapologetically the haze, so mystifyingly comforting now, becomes a shroud, a nightmare impossible to run from because your limbs turn to stone as in a child's bad dream, an inundating fear of unexplainable motionlessness. Do it in the soft lumiere of this dawn, where we remove the pastoral of our shoes in reverence and let memory return. Do it like so much more than a prayer. A whispering above the roar of breakers is a whimper, a rolling over, a surrender of our story. These bones must be more than fossils. These living shards more than an ancient potter's fingers. 
of the past. Do it while the clay is still wet in our hands, or there will be nothing for the children, only a smudged memory of Holocaust. Thank you. I think as the night goes on, you, you'll find that there'll be more and more raging, lamenting, um, cursing um, about what passes for development here. Um, so many of the poets are, are, are seized with a, with a rage and a sorrow about the desecration of nature that, that, that happens. Um, so much of it unnecessary, so much of it in the name of a, something called progress that needs to be questioned. Um, so, and again, that's, 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 that's their spirit in there as well. You know? um, in relation to the Creole poem, something very, very intriguing I find is happening there. Because um, there, there, there's, there's a kind of stereotype of, of Creole in the society um, that, that the language is good for, for jokes, um, for, for vigorous exchange, for aggressive bashing out, you know, that, that person's on for a very active, engaging description of things, you know. Um, yeah, it's true, it's good for that. But we, we seldom think of it as um, or associated first with um, a softness and, and an intimacy, uh, an intimacy that's not necessarily associated with sexual relationship, you know, because that's, that's another thing, you know. Um, and I think this poet has deliberately set himself against the stereotype of Creole, very, very deliberately. And he's, he's created, or he's set himself to creating poetry that shows the other side, the softer side, the more intimate, you know, the interior side of it. Um, and to do so, he's reaching for vocabulary that you don't really hear very much anymore. He's reaching for the vocabulary of his grandparents and the people of that generation a word like DCP, which, you know, I mean, you'll figure from English that it's dissipate. But you really, I, I don't know where I would hear anybody, um, even out, you know, in the rural area, say a word like DCP. It's, it'll be very, very rare. But he's reaching for that kind of vocabulary because that, that kind of vocabulary has, has the qualities that he's looking for to create the texture of, of language that, 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 he, that he wants. Um, what's interesting, too, is that He's writing in that kind of Creole. Um, when I listen to when I listen to, to the the rhythms that are going on in in the poem, it's the kind of rhythms that that will sit very very easily in a a, a, a free verse English love poem. You know, um, even even one that's sort of fairly metered. So there's an interesting kind of hybrid going on here, where where the language. Oh, and certain rare qualities in language are kind of being brought to light and, and, and poetry is being created within it. But it's being created um, in rhythms that are associated with another language. It's a very, very interesting hybrid. Later, later on in, um, in, the, later on in, in tonight's um, slate of poets, you'll hear a Creole poem that is in the rhythm of Creole. Because Creole, Creole has all kind of rhythms, every language has all kind of rhythms. This is deliberately not trying to do that. It's going for a hybrid. And it's pointing, I think, to, to possibilities in the poetic tradition, because once you start to blend and mix different elements, then you know, the, the tradition starts to expand on you and do, do amazing things. So, look how we may see our shy, we say, George. Um, the next poet I'm going to call on, um, I think the less that um, I say about him, the better. Um, I'd like to call on um, Kendall Lippolet. <laughs> <laughs> A little pieces. <clears throat> island poem. This island is struggling to write itself into a poem that cannot be erased. Waves are speaking themselves onto beaches, urging the sand to keep 
the lines hastily scribbled on spaces left in front of deck chairs. Inland, sunlight and shadow are printing cries of fleeing birds onto brown pages of the ground. Bear after bulldozers rubbed out the italic writing of acacias punctuation marks of cactus. The narrowed eyes of spirit illiterate men squinted almost shut from scrutinizing watermarks on dollar bills. I've never read what earth wrote here. This island, 238 pages of illuminated manuscript was written in a language they have never learned. Foreigners to it. What they hope for is erasure. Bare, bland sheets of golf courses. Roads that strike through verses of mangrove. Raised birdless vegetation. No scrawl of a creature anywhere. The right in the mountain is low, though so the climb. Thus, wise men look over the eyes of the mind, between the shadow and the light, they find their certainties. For the searcher, sunset always is a sign. Day into night, good into evil, Intertwined, they cannot separate and be their own realities. Life is a right of one's wisdom, though slow decline. And so the seer upon his deathbed, knowing all divine, sings to the dying sun bright angels' melodies. For the searcher, sunset always is a sign. Life is a ripening onto the sun, though slow decline. The story that is told about today is that um, on his deathbed, he was as he moved towards his death, he was spontaneously composing hymns and singing them as he went towards his death. Um, without it, uh, um, he, a lot of poetry has come out, has been coming at us so far, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, how do I put this? It's, it's going out there, it's taking on the big things. Um, that's a necessary part of the tradition. Also on the poetry that goes in, 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 into the, into the personal, into the small places, the vulnerable places, um, very, very personal. And this, this next poet is uh, absolutely bizarre. Called Jane King. For Fergus. When Fergus was dying, I had this fantasy that when some people die, they ought to leave spaces like holes in the air where they used to be. Walking around quite normally, we'd stumble on these places and choke and gasp and vacuum till the realization oh, this is where he was. We need true memories, not just vague traces. But well before he died, I'd feel a soul deep irritation when he would try to drift and they would shake him, trying to bring a little more life from him. I wanted him to go with peaceful celebration. I touched his body, 
after they'd roped it in a sheet so porters could sling it casually onto a barrel. He was not in it, though we felt him there in the room. And walking down a common castry street later, I wanted to sing, feeling his sudden joyous presence everywhere, from far beyond his death, amazed. He sent a living blessing, tingling through the air. This one is called The Lecturer Lady. She says, assuming all of us Miamiites, as well as Anglicans, that those of us who were in church on Sunday, August 23rd, and not at home, nearly shut doors, taking down the pictures, will remember that the psalm was 46. Therefore we will not fear. Though earth be moved and mountains topple and depths of sea, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Is if you would find something to suck comfort from, you need to make your own community. Huddled in your room closet, hiding from maddening winds, whiplash of rain, your death stalking. If you would have a fragment to clutch salvation from, you should have been at church. Some poem could then visit you, fly into your heart like a rosary to hold. Concrete walkways do not succeed in keeping nature out. See, here and there, small leaves have fossiled themselves into man-made stone. Yet you have to make your own, knowing it will be blown down, broken, overgrown. Still, you have to make it. Yeah, Ace of Spades. The others worked outside me. I, tucked in myself, was trying to die. I did not want to eat or drink, be stuck with ivies, walk, or think. They try to talk. I'd only hear weird vocalizing, quacking, queer. I turned away, I faced the wall. I did not want the work at all. And there he lay, my lovely death, so gently waiting. Breathed my breath. I felt his own upon my face. Such tenderness, such loving grace. If now is my time to go with you, this time I can. It's okay, boy. If I could just find this one. Okay. This is a villanelle for Daniel. I knew that love was always laced with dread, but never felt it stronger or more clearly until the day you curled up in my head. They brought you in, your little moppy head. I realized I had to love you dearly. I knew that love was always laced with dread. I knelt with terror at your baby bed, almost convinced you would stop breathing queerly. That was the day you curled up in my head. The mean and bitter things my mother said taught me how frightening love is very early. 
I always knew that love was laced with dread. Can I love anyone in love? I pled. And then I had to face it very clearly upon the day you curled up in my head. I loved you more than life itself. I bled because my joy was just to love you, really. I knew that love was always laced with thread. And then you came and curled up in my head. fanatic about poetic craft, whether it be in you know, standard traditional forms or in free verse and so on. It's very, very particular about the craft aspect of poetry. So I give thanks. Um, it's another echo of Derek. Um, the next poet I'm going to bring on is a phenomenon. Um, I, I, I don't know of a precedent, I am, really and truly. I don't know of any antecedents, any followers of him. Um, I'll, I'll just bring him on. Ras Eisley. The pen, the people, and the writer. An unheard tune, an unheard tune, an imaginative song plays somewhere, and only the pain hears. It then gets up and dances across that papery floor. Guided by the hand of the writer, its only partner. Gracefully leaping, jumping, turning like a ballerina, forming letter after letter into word, word after word, stitched into sentence, sentence after sentence into paragraph, paragraph after paragraph, still, ceaselessly dancing to that unheard tune, to that imaginative song across that paved floor, encouraged by its partner, the writer. When the pen stops dancing, as tired as can be, he lays down, relax, and look back at what it just did, and what it danced. It sees that they are the architects of building books of learning, of building the world. They are the pen the paper, and the right. Here ends my first point.
Stay Mr. Tree. Lend me your stem. Cause I want to build a drum. To build a rhythm. To keep the African culture alive. Hey Mr. Cole. Lend me your skill. Cause I want to build a drum. To build a rhythm. To keep the solution culture alive. Hey Mr. Han. Lend me your hands. Cause I want to build a drum. To build a rhythm. To keep the African solution culture alive. Listen to the voice of the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum. Listen to the voice of the drum. This is a kitty drum. This is a gene intro from Ghana, Africa. This one I've got there. This is from Ghana, Africa. Listen to the voice of the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum. Listen to the voice of the drum. Drum, dance. As a warrior, yes, we know you. The ancestors that empower you. The spirit of the slave that encourage you. Rastafari, I will be call you. King, I will be hear you. Queen, I will be crown you. Flow Wagaya, he lets me on the moon. Sesem Descat, he lets me on the moon. There is Walcott, he lets me on the moon. Jinx Compton, T. Les Piotobu. So after Louis, T. Les Piotobu. After Nature's Laborda, T. Les Piotobu. Jake Compton, T. Les Piotobu. Gandalf the Clay, T. Les Piotobu. Rasket Truth, T. Les Piotobu. Marcus Gavi, T. Les Piotobu. Malcolm X, T. Les Piotobu. Martin Luther King, T. Les Piotobu. Rasgob Mali, T. Les Piotobu. A hey, Mr. Tree, lend me your stain, cause I want to build a drum, to build a rhythm, to keep the African culture alive. A hey, Mr. Gold, lend me your skin, cause I want to build a drum, to build a rhythm, to keep the solution culture alive. A hey, Mr. Man, lend me your hands, cause I want to build a drum, to build Irritating to keep the solution African culture alive. Listen to the voice of the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum. Listen to the voice of the drum. First piece, with, you know, no, no drum, no, no chants, no, no, no chorus for the, for the audience. Just, just a voice, painting, painting pictures, creating images, um, and any rhythms that happen, happen just because they, they, they're following the movement of his thought. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I love, I love the other work as well. The, 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 the kind of brass idea that the public more often sees, uh, like in the second one. Um, but I, I, I really love that first one. I really love that, that image of the, the, the paper as a papery floor that the pen dances on. It's a, you know, it's a startling image. Um, more than one poet um, in the course of the night, a couple of them, um, take a, a quick look at the relationship between the writer and, and writing, the process of writing. 
and I, 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 like, I like the way I like the way this one's done. So, giving thanks. Um, the the other one is is, is, is classic Raza Isley, and there's, there's something I want to say. You see, because I, I said when I was introducing that he doesn't have a precedent and he doesn't he has no followers. Because you see, yeah, you, you, you I've come across all of us have come across um, different different um, concerts and so on. You may come across a poet who, with a particular poem, um, may be working with the drum, whether he or she is the one playing it, or persons are playing it, you know, other persons are playing it. You come across that. Um, the closest that there is to a sort of ancestor, and yet still not exactly so, is Fish Alphas in, in, his, in his days of working with La Poca Buit. But, and, and I, I hail Fish, and I hail that group and what they did. But even, even that is not quite the same thing because Fish would have been working with drummers working behind him, you know, drummers playing with him, and sometimes voices, you know, and that's one thing, it's wonderful. But that, that dialogue, that, that duo of brass Isley and the drum, is the two of them, you know, they're always you know, they're coming up and getting on the stage. It's the two of them, it's a conversation happening between the two of them. I don't know anyone here who did that before him. I don't know if anyone here is doing it after him, but I hope that there will be other persons coming up because it is it's an aspect of our poetic tradition that is very, very singular, you know, really, really singular. Um, and I, I hope it can catch on more. It, take, it takes particular skills to do that kind of thing, but I mean, you know, that, that I don't think is the issue, but whatever it is that, that drove him to go into that particular form, I hope that spirit can, can, catch, can catch on and, and other persons take it up to. I hope that work can be recorded sensitively and for it to spread out, for it to go online and to, you know, to, to be there in the airwaves more and to, yeah, that will help to, to spread the tradition more. So, um, yeah, blessings, yeah, blessings. <coughs> Um, the, yeah, and, and just, just very, in terms of the ideas in the poem, uh, particularly in the second one, cultural heritage is, a, is something that zips in and out through, throughout the um, number of poets' work. Isaiah as Rastafarian is, is focusing on one aspect of the cultural heritage, the African one, very, very valid, very, very necessary. And it's wonderful that he's bringing it full blown into our faces like this, something that we need to grapple with and seek to understand. And, yeah. Okay, um, next person that I'm going to call on is such a fascinating poet. Um, she, she even has two names, uh, you know, it's, I don't even know if I, sh I should reveal her the name, but she, yeah, I think she works for the CIA or something, but anyway. Um, <laughs> publicly, in a published work, which has begun to find its way out there, she is Virginia Archer, to ask me why. Um, but I know her as Jean Medrick, and we call on Jean. Yeah, kind of, kind of exposing me, okay. All right, my first piece is called, let me get my proper glasses on, Sunday Morning with My Father. The woolen carpet of the 70s living room, the sideboard tight against the wall, and record player, the 45s in crisp sleeves stacked high. My father, standing middle of the room, ironing board, cradling work shirts and steam. He says, dance for me, Jeannie. Puts on Elvis, Brenda Lee, Shirley Bassey, Ray Charles, all the notes hanging on the Sunday air. And there, his hands outstretched, I stand on his feet as he teaches me intricacies of foxtrot, waltz, and jive, my little feet picked up by his as we whirl around through the sunlight of the large bay windows, until we both smell burning. The iron's imprint now a reminder of our dance and we laugh. Music was there too when my grandmother died. 
her darkened flat filled with bottles and records. Pick one, Jeannie, he said. A song to carry a memory, the Jamaican scar, baseline heavy with the islands they had both left behind. I carry that reminder in the beat of every lyric I've ever met since. I have stood on stages, the worn wooden boards, carrying the scuff marks of dances new. La Comette, Quadrille, Widova, Shak Shak and Tambu beating out rhythms my feet followed, as if born to them. My father's feet, always somehow under mine, like a song of Sunday morning. My second piece is called, Lost Luggage is Always Beaten Up by the Time You Find It Again. <laughs> Lost. Some spare change that the couch swallowed and one gray sock that disappeared between the wash and rinse cycles. Lost. My glasses, every 30 minutes, that evaporate from the desk and end up on the bathroom counter. Lost. The feel of your thigh under my palm as we drove in the dark. The stars bigger than I'd ever seen them because love makes everything larger until it leaves. Found. Pieces of my heart. There's a lot of duct tape and it stutters on some days when it feels cold. But it beats. Lost. One dream of home. Found. A way to cling to love, poetry, stories of corny Netflix princesses, my side of the bed, lost, love. I want to see you, but my rose-colored glasses keep fogging up, and I have no more change for the bus, and my palms have never felt colder, and I don't know when there will be star-filled skies and poetry where you stay. Thank you. They gotta stop doing that. These, these, um, I don't wanna say these women poets because that's not, that's not really as, as straightforward as that. There are a couple of other women poets um, later on in the program, or they, they, they're doing different things. But it's um, fascinating to me that, that both of the sets of poems that have taken us inside to the, to the soft places, to the vulnerable places, to relationship and so on, have been, have been, women, have been women poets. Um, Jean, Jean's a fascinating poet. I, I, I like her, her, her take on, 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 on cultural heritage. Um, like in, in, in that first poem, um, a number of her poems um, deal with cultural heritage in, in, in one way or another, and in a very, very nuanced way. I mean, someone, someone like Ras Isley has his viewpoint very clearly um, worked out and settled and in him as a source of absolute conviction, and he's speaking from that. Jean is also working through issues of cultural heritage, has worked through issues of cultural heritage. Her position is more nuanced in a sense, like Derek's. It's, you know, it's a more nuanced position. Um, what, where, where do we start in relation to all these different elements that have come to make the Caribbean the Caribbean and, and our ancestors via you know, family and otherwise? Where do we stand in relation to them? Um, her poetry goes into things like that. Um, no, no simple conclusions, um, but fascinating exploring happening in there. Um, <clears throat> the, She's also really, really wonderful on form. She's relentlessly curious about exploring forms um, in poetry. I, I, I like, she, she has a, a kind of a sly humor, like, like in the title of that, um, of that second one about lost luggage is always, whatever it is, dented, battered, whatever, when you found it. Um, she just was kind of throwing these titles in there. What? what? And then you need to kind of dwell with the poem a little bit before you see how the title fits in, you know? 
again, all I will say is the more different aspects, facets, differences that there are in the poetic tradition, the once it's well done, then the, then the better the tradition is, the richer, the more varied it is, the more it, the more it appeals to so many different kinds of persons and perspectives and so on. So um, I, give, I, give, I give thanks for what Jean has brought for us. Um, the, the next poet that I want to bring on, um, I'll just say his name and then comment afterwards. Um, I don't have to call him a young man, he's in his 40s, so whatever, man. Um, <laughs> Um, Alvin Asmelius. I first poem. Grandpa Storyteller. My grandfather told good stories. He read them from the volume of leaves on the forest floor. Or seen them in the letters of light on the hanging forest canopy. We always sat in awe like river stones, listening to the continual babble of running water. We would look at him, lines on his face like wrinkles on a tree trunk as our blood warmed on the burning, glowing wood fire. We watched his tongue curl for syllables of patois. And the bottom was always peeking through the darkness with two fireflies for eyes. And the jangage was always making sounds under the silhouetted trees. At these times, the moon smiled in mockery and the flashing stars were ghosts feeding our fear. But we loved these stories. Though the night was sleepless, cause the creatures stayed up till daylight, flaring and capering in the woods. <laughs> the vendor. The sea breeze whispers a song about life crafted along the carnage. In the shadow of ships of loading its cargo of tourists, buy one, get one, nothing's for free. Morning a hymn of traffic, sound of unpacking before the hectic, displaying the works of fingers, bent in toil, making pieces of the island. Buy one, get one, nothing's for free. Sons helping mothers carry, daughters sewing in a hurry, dresses hanging in the sea breeze, the bright fabric of days, decades. Buy one, get one, nothing's for free. Grain clouds that threaten, gray hairs that stitch time before it is forgotten, laced with smiles that open opportunities from Madras bags that beg us to remember. Buy one, get one, nothing's for free. Buy one, sell one, nothing's for free. Unpacking little tokens of community, booths brushed with festive colors, painting a theme that tropical is not always easy. That toil is not always sweaty. Buy one, get one, nothing's for free. <laughs> Poverty line. If you see me below the poverty line, I hanging on to it, but them rich folks walking on it like a tightrope, 
piercing my fingers with their spell-like stilettos. I don't understand how I still hanging on. But I must, even if at times my hands are too busy to mind children, to cook what's left in Hubbard's cupboard, to feed them mouths that wide open all day and night crying, Daddy, we hungry. If you see me below the poverty line, I hanging on to it, but them folk, them poor folks, weighing me down with their put down, low in the line with false hopes. I don't know how, but I'm still hanging on. If you see me below the poverty line, I'm sure you see me, politician, master of hocus pocus. You better focus below the poverty line and meet my situation with a reasonable solution. <laughs> On development. First came axes and chainsaws. On dressing of one canopy after another. Backhoes and bulldozers reshaped her mounds, belching black smoke above nude grounds. Then high up in the sky, in silent, salient protest, a scissor bird cuts signed contracts, jet lines blueprints, colorful neckties, subverted perception, SUVs idling, AC cooling, fossil fuel, burnout. A people's price for, for progress. A nation's neglect of the nature for pecuniary priorities. Species disappear, awaiting reintroduction, fossilized in folklore, paraded in pantomime, monetized memorabilia, souvenirs for tourists. A chain of islands on a blue chiffon dress worn for dinner parties, furtively dominating delegates. The frigate migrated. No more paradise in parody. Dilapidated buildings stand a monument to failed schemes weathered by the wind a willing shelter. The forest we threw out crawls back in. Um, maybe somewhere there's a poet who likes tourism. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I haven't come across any of them. These are the kind of tourism that we do. I haven't come across any of them yet, but uh, hey, there's always hope. Um, like yeah. Tourism? Beg your pardon? Maybe. Like maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But um, yeah, the, the, the work, I mean, I, I, I don't need to go into detail. We can see where the work picks up the echoes that, that um, in, in, in other poets, I mean, MacDonald began, began the, the night on that note. And it's picked up here the, the, the trivialization of our culture, um, trivialization and, and sort of crass monetization of our culture, the, the, the destruction of nature for dubious schemes and so on, and you know, kind of a paradise that is always like, you know, in the distance and, 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 and failing. Um, it's it's all there. It's all there. And what, what's what's interesting for me is or one thing that's interesting for me going back to poetic tradition is um, most of certainly at least two of the poems. Um, the, the, the language of all this, like in the vendor and the poverty line, the language of it is very much the language of the persons who are suffering from this. So, so you, 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 feel, you feel the perspective from, from which that, that those kind of feelings come because it's very, very close to the language in which a vendor herself would speak and so on. You know, that's, so that's, um, yeah. And even when, even when the language gets more, more imagistic, um, like, like in undevelopment, um, the, the images themselves are so, so clear, so photographically clear that they, they, they make the impact, you know? 
Um, I, I, like, I like the grandpa poem at the beginning, and I, and I, was, trying to, I was trying to puzzle out, yeah, why do I like it? And you know what? It's, it's because it's so much from a child's point of view. You can see it's an adult looking back, but it's, it's so easy and happens so often that when adults look back at um, yeah, childhood and so on, there's a thing, oh God, it's gone. You know, there's, a, there's a nostalgia and a, you know, um, a weakness and a lament and a dirge and that kind of thing. And I find this one doesn't, doesn't really, really do that. There may be a little hint of it in the background, but basically it's a child telling what, what this thing was like. And I find that that's a wonderful balance to, to the poems, which are also necessary too, that are always lamenting the, the loss of tradition and, and so on, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's lovely to hear a child's, a child's voice. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so we're moving on. Um, and um, I think we, we, we're more than halfway through our conversation here tonight. Um, this poet is fascinating in all kinds of ways, so let me just let the man do his thing. Yeah? Um, I've been watching him for, for some years now. Glenn Charlery. Prisoner. Peering through bars of dreadlocks dangling in front of his face. He feels like a prisoner, locked out by society from all opportunities for daring to show his affinity to his African race. It's as if he's only allowed to be dark in skin tone, but not in ethnicity. You see, while others uplift their nations by pushing their children farther, our people are only consumed with winning souls for the old colonial god, ostracizing those who won't submit to the god of the former slave master, as if they would spoil the children if they didn't abuse them with the rod. And so he had been put out on the street by his own mother, Seen a monster, another son who still loves her. His family too withhold the help at their disposal to offer, calling tough love the torment they see to it that he suffers. He gets called to interviews only to be told that there are no vacancies. His qualifications won't help him land a job. Turning up their noses. They fail to see him for who he truly is. And that's a better person than any societal snob. Now, he is a genius for which the world longs, but will never get to know. He's drawn with a revelation on an island prison, locked behind bars, but not of black metal but of unbending men whose minds are as narrow and whose hearts are as hard and cold as any bars of iron are. Peering through the barred window of a prison cell at a full moon which seems much as a cataract in the eye of justice. Blinded from seeing the iniquity in arresting our youth who sell herb, sending them to jail for simply possessing a couple strips. He feels like a political prisoner caught in the imperialist's ideological war. One who won't renounce his culture and bow to an interloper's cross who faces persecution under the guise of them enforcing anti-drug laws. And freedom seen from this spiritual prison will only come at a heavy cost, as these are the very dictates of the God in whom we trust. He cannot understand why his own people hate him so much, nor can he see any justification for all of their disgust. 
But this, sadly, is what our social conditioning has done to us. Society denies itself by denying him from making his contribution possibilities that only might have been. While he tries not to give in to the demon, the cataract of air discrimination is constantly invoking inside of him by affirming that every time they discriminate or otherwise try to belittle us, in the realm of the conscience, it is they who have committed the crime. And behind that pin veil of mammon, it is they, not we, who are the prisoners, trapped within the very narrow confines of their small minds. I looked at the poem on the page, and um, peculiar kind of feelings because, in in one in one sense, when I just look at words on the page, the feeling like there's a poem that that that, that has like a rant in it, and a, you know, and a, and a, a raging and so on in it, and yet not quite. There, there's there's a, a, a kind of a dispassionate stepping back and, and, and a kind of a, a cool kind of critiquing of the system and, and what it does to young persons, particularly young, young Rastafarians. Um, and that, that comes over in the delivery. It's like somewhere halfway between a, a, a sermon um, that, that's holding itself tight and somewhere halfway between that and, and, a, and a, a, an examination of, of the system. It, it's somewhere in between those two. And, he, and even in the form of it, I mean, when I looked at it closer, I, I'm realizing there's, there's work going on there in rhyme, there's a rhyme scheme that's going on in there. The, the, the actual rhythmic consistencies that are happening in there. And at the same time, it's verging towards like spoken word form. It's somewhere in between the two, you know? Um, so I, 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 I find it an, an absolutely uh, fascinating piece. And to me, the, the type of delivery too kind, kind of captures the, the kind of hybrid nature um, of it. So, hey, the more different types of work that you have, more, more varied traditions. Yes. Um, I want to call on um, someone who's going to take us um, into and out of Creole territory um, and into a narrative that is just too, too, too common now. Access, Ishmael. Remnants of a dying culture. Boom, boom, boom. Bon Dieu, ça qui vive là. Heartbeats quicken like the tempo of the taboo. Faded, barely audible, somewhere in the distance. And through the veins, blood rushes as Maybe the blood of the young gushes then peters out. Saki Vibela. Someone asks aloud while someone else dials the number of a neighbor higher up the road as they anticipate disheartening tragic news. Soon, perhaps, a siren will be heard in the distance. Saki Vibela. Me poco sav ki les ye. And they wonder aloud what happening with the youth. Where did they go wrong? And how? How do they fix this? Ha se mamai jodia. They have nothing else to do. Nothing better to do to pass the time. Pistot lane say boom, 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 kipaka fini. Boom, 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 the modern music on the other side. Pounding, earthquaking, heart wrenching, air aching, boom, 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 gunshots ringing out each day as the life of another young soul drains. An underutilized brain, a surgeon perhaps, perhaps an undiscovered talent, perhaps 
an unfulfilled musician, or an artist of sorts. Remember Ronnie Walter? The youth is dying at their own hands, as is the culture, paling, bleeding, paling in comparison to yesterday, alive, vibrant, alive, hopeful, alive. Like in the distance by sailing shop, the solo group continues the chanting as Shak Shak Man leans forward, then he bends back. So the Shak Shak in his hands, the music in his veins, the culture in his soul, the energy in his body rock the crowd. And Frank Norville, he on the quattro, and Estefan on the banjo, and Charlie there with his violin, and Simonette beating down the back of a table like the devil after he, and Sesen the shirt well bellows while the crowd echoes. All the while, sequin in the center, whining she waves like it have no tomorrow. The music hitting, she waves like hard like a topi, fast, fast, so then slow. And when the music hits, she again, boy, sequin whining so. The rhythm in she heaps, the power in she feet, bare on the packed, rain stuffed earth, she kick up dust, throw her hands in the air, then put them back to the back of she waves. And her eyes bright so, like the stars of the with the fire in them like the flames of the pot under of the fuye, sorry, under the pot of dumpling and la cochon, and the red beans doing a dance in there with all of the local seasonings, and the large hoop of sequin earrings, they're bouncing like the crowd now gathered around her. And look how her bangles, they jiggling, they dancing, they chanting, making sweet music like the Shotwell Sesen, like she waistlines and the chain round she neck, pounding on your chest like Simonette, on the table tapping that goat skin like when your mother give you a good licking cause you were listening. And now, the music in sequin waistline take you and your right foot start to tap on the floor too. And then, you lost your shoe. The connection to the bare earth sending ripples through you and the life of the earth making your blood rush, making your waistline start to revolve like the earth, it spin and it spin and it spin, and overtaken by the music without and within, you in the center too. Solo dancer, join the line, how it stretched so, and it bends so, and it bends so, and it bend, until it closed and it make a circle within a larger circle, as Shak Shak Man bends so, and he dips so, and Charlie, he thrusts so, and the rest of Mamai Lakai, that folklore band, they sway the crowd. They rock the crowd, they move the crowd, and the vibrations of the waistline and the drumming of feet carry a message back home to settle quivering hearts. And it passed way back behind La Saucier. And when it hit waters, it make the ocean waves ripple so like your waistline. And it traveled the waters all the way back to Africa and it tell the story of how our culture not dead. And the boom, boom, boom that you hear, the boom, boom, boom that you hear tonight is only tip and the boys bursting bamboo while Simonet on the turbo. And Sese in the shirt well, she's singing so well. And the rest of the crew having a good time too. And Sequin still there in the center and you're there with her together like the leaves of the mango long tree dancing to the music of the cool breeze. You think is that the dancing too, but you never did know is the music they feeling so. Why the hell she calls it remnants of a dying culture? I don't know, because it don't feel like that. You know, it, it don't. It, it, uh, it doesn't. It, it's, you, 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 feel, you feel the culture working its way back up and, and bursting through. The poem has so much energy and it moves between Creole English and, and uh, between Creole English and Creole. It moves in and out between it so, you know, so, so, so seamlessly. And there's such, there's such energy, so much, you know, so much natural rhythms going on in there. I, I wish I understood why she, um, why she called it that. I don't know. Maybe she's being ironic. Um, but yeah, I, I, give, I, give, I give thanks for that. Um, we're three more poet, poets coming in to, to talk to us. I just kind of want to alert you to that because the night is long. So, um, without um, any kind of long preamble, um, and all those lay people here going to kind of like, ooh, 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 and I know the next name of the person. But um, yeah, this is a, a son of just outside Lucian soil, 
but um, but but grows in the soil. So Vladimir Lucien. So you know the form you have to fill out when you're traveling and you, they ask if you have anything to declare and all of you here lie and say you have anything, you don't have anything in your bag. This poem is if you had to tell the truth. <laughs> Declaration, description of articles. Barrett pepper, tamarind ball, guava jam, guava cheese, local rum, cocoa stick, fish wrapping, newspaper, cinnamon, nutmeg, spice rum, bay rum, soft candle, coconut balls, fudge, tablet, seasonings, a whole damn ham, a dashin, a yam, breadfruit, a hand of green fig, mango long, sweet mango julie, mango tiffy, a hard flat biscuit called lava bad named after Barbados, bowl that the old women used to make in their home, and an old time sweet called comfort. <laughs> Sambo one for my grandfather, Samuel Lucien. You, know, you would have never think was the same Sambo who didn't go no secondary school, who had to carry the stink of fish in a basket on his head, walking from Grosely to Castries. The same Sambo who leave for the war but reach too late, who eat his farine and fish in a civilized fight between knife and fork and etiquette on his plate, peeling the skin from his avocado pear, the same Sambo who parts his hard hair like a red sea disagreeing with prophecy, who spreads salvation like a tablecloth over his soul. Yes, the same Sambo turned Eucharistic minister, justice of the peace. Who would have known the way he carries himself, the way he had the presence of a conch shell blown? Basil. The boys still slamming their dominoes outside of brother's place. Basil, who used to be a sweet boy in his day, starring in the country and western dances, used to be a carpenter, he say, with the best wood in the whole island. Now sits limp and old, slamming dominoes hard on the table with three of his partners wearing their crumpled fedoras pushed back on their heads. Basil has had enough woman in his day, has drowned his liver in rum and good company, has lived all the life he ever cared to live. Now he has built a long line of dominoes, holding the last one in his hand suspended over the board, knowing that on either end of that long white road with its small black dots like a map of all the funerals he has attended, it is his turn to play. That no matter what any of his partners do, they cannot stop him. No matter how much his children, mothers quarrel tonight, a man don't go home until he's ready. This one is dedicated to my grandfather's brother, who people from Grosley would know as Bravely. Right. Uncle Bravely still comes like he used to do on Sundays, calling us, his brother's grandchildren, uncle. Looking from underneath those barbed wire eyebrows that still prohibit his eyes, comes again to the step of Sambo's well-respected house. He doesn't ask for money or for rum. He does not even stick his tongue to the side of his mouth like he used to in the way that made people call him Wolo. He just comes like the time when he went out to sea and didn't return, when everybody thought he had drowned, walking through his own absence, wanting nothing more than to lift things, to feel again the heaviness of life, then let go, to walk up and down in memory, like the cupped heart of a fishing boat beating on the sea. Circle. 
In the little circle at lunchtime, the girls and the boys' mouths chime in with songs like Pink girls are pinky do, pink girls are jukesa, ay 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 jukesa, oh yo yo ya jukesa. And boys whining with girls, girls whining with girls, boy whining with boy. And Sister Jess with her panty high up in her waist, hearing the noise, come out in the door of the classroom to watch. To see what is the cause of all them little laughters. All that snickering like rat feet running in the rafters. All that happily ever after of lunchtime. And she see a circle. And it growing bigger and bigger with children. More and more children and patsy in the middle of the belly of that beast. In the belly of the beast of that circle like a navel. And she getting on slack. And they singing, my mother sent me to school to learn my ABC. The teacher call me damn fool, I call her damn fool back. And Patsy goes straight in front of Sheldon and she whine and she whine and she whine down to the bottom of Sister Jess' morality, low, 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 low. And Sister Jess, seeing all that contact of flesh, put her eyes to the sky, nod her head back down to reality, then she gone in the class. When she come down the stairs, she spot Patsy with her waist flickering like a star cast in darkness and give her seven lashes sticked in her ass. What up? Just like that. Patsy crush up her face like homework paper and start bawling the place down. She throw herself on the ground and Sister Jess, still hot in her head with her parachute panty, didn't yet come back down to earth. She hear even hear, she hear, even hear Patsy sucking her teeth, chops in loud like nobody business. Sister Jess was tired, and she couldn't believe it's that little thing that gets her tired so. But then days and months passing, and the circle of her belly, her belly getting rounder, and she feeling something getting on inside her, and like her panty couldn't even cover her navel again. The priest and them start to watch her, and she bow her head, because she had no. And before the circle of her belly could grow, she go to her old doctor in the clean white secret of his office, and she put an end to all that jambili jambili jukisa in her belly to take out the ring game in there. And just so, just so, Sister Jess turned she circle back into a square. Thank you. Uh, when, when you see on here Creole English, um, Operating comfortably with that kind of level of imagery, um, you, you, you realize the, the possibilities for it are endless, as, as it should be. Because language is language, no, no, no matter what, you know, no matter what. And the, the more, the more you put pressure and stress on the language, and you come at it with a poet instinct, the more, the more the language responds to you and starts to give you things that, you know, you never believe would have happened. You know, so um, yeah, that's that is a part. Of, of Derek's tradition as well, so I go back to the school of flight and other things later down when we went into um, um, uh, that, 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 that wonderful one, that's the way he's sitting on the bus, the light of the world, you know. The, um, yeah, that, that, that too is a part of, 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 the, of, the, of the choral bed, and it's wonderful to see this particular type of choral that, 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 um, that Vlad brought here so flourishing and coming. It, it, it made the future look bright, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I want to bring in someone from Mondopo, um, and we're going back into the Creole language. Not only that one, but we're going back into the Creole language for one last look before we, we start to um, before we start to wind things down. So, cut a long story short, Liz Fissel, he's gone. I've been watching this perform for I've been watching this perform for a while, and um, the Creole poem that that she that she's going to do. Um, I, I was doing some workshop stuff and so on in England some couple of years ago, and um, one, one workshop that I was in was a workshop where they were dealing with translation of, of work from her piece. So I'd chosen that, that, that the Creole poem that she's going to do, give a basic translation of it, and then persons were working from the basic translation that I did, and I spoke about the Creole culture that the poem came, the poem came from, etc., and persons were coming up with their own versions their own English words, these are, you know, English people, and they come up with their own versions of the, you know, kind of core translation that I did. And there's some fascinating stuff happening. But what it's telling me is that, again, what I'm saying, language is language, and once the language is operating at a certain level, then it will, yeah, it's, it's worthy. You know, it's 
it's worthy, it, it, can, it can stand up anywhere. So, Liz. My first piece is entitled, What I Am to Poetry. Poetry, you are nothing without me. Without my nonsensical feelings wrapped in the pen I clutch with my fist, splashing onto the sheet, the mimicking ink that spills out my lyrics, the thoughts snatched from my cerebrum, and the sculpted masterpiece crafted with intense concentration. You are nothing without me. There is nowhere in this world you'd be if you hadn't slipped your hands up my mind's dress as we echoed soft silhouettes of thoughts and clear in distant corners of the horizon. And me, putting down the rhythm of how good it felt when you made love to me, penetrating my thoughts and gyrating inside me, my brain filled with words from the high of cocaine, Implanted and rooted in the blood flowing through my veins, becoming addictively insane. Oh, poetry. You have no idea what you've done to me. And while you brainwashed me till I made sense of every stanza as they came all over this blank piece of paper, it was me. Carving poetic librettos to a language you and I decipher. If it wasn't for the creative thoughts perfected by perfecting you, the emotional connection acquired with some perplexity seeping through, the effortless efforts of this lyrical intervention that you're susceptible to, there would be no you. There would be no metaphorical finesse to connect my rhythmical sonnets. There would be no rhythm in rhymes released as I deliver my poetic bliss. There would be no endless echoing of words in the depths of my mind as they flow fruitfully, vivaciously. There would be no you without me. No me combining delicious ingredients of thoughts eloquently. No me expressing expressions, jotting emotions incessantly. No poetry. No turning life to color, with intellectual excellence painted on canvas, with the evidence of my presence reflecting the words I utter. So poetry, you need to accept the inevitable escapade of our destiny, that our souls are bonded and we cannot function separately. Poetry, you will remain part of me, but you are and will always be nothing without me. Thank you. Okay, so my next piece is a Creole piece. It is entitled Le Mwemo. Même quand on bobo qui ka di oui, Le Mwemo, il ka passer. La vie ka y continue, Le Mwemo. Tout moun ka y oublie. Es yo kai chanje, es ou kwe yo kai chanje? Yo kai plewe, yo kai hele, le dezye mwen femi. Maman mwen, che yi kai kase, pou we piti kongwan, pou we tout bon jan pote fle le ishli ka tiwi. Moun kai femi che yo wed konfinet, moun kai tombe, moun kai dubo dwet. Ada kai si pote, ada kai bizwe let. Le mwen ou ve zel vole soti an la visa la. Ki sa ki kai fet? Es bel te mwen kai weste, es si kai balye soti an li de yo net. Es si yo kai kontine moveste kon vye bet. Mem kon ti mwen mai ki ache la fwa e pi kouay pou viv la vi san an papa. Même quand une jeune femme qui a tiré la peine font un sekeiche pour oublier toi ka. Même quand un joli fleur joue un glow après il pousse sec un soleil là. Les moins allés, les moins volés, il caille sain mais bobo a caille jewi. 
Moi dit il kay détruit mené en noisy en simple ici. J'ai que moun ki pate konnèt moi kay vini, vini ensemble porter tout ça yoni. Même quand glo la rivière ka roulé jique tan y rivé en bouche la mer, tout hélé ni pou fini. Même quand soleil ka brûlé les ciels tourné blé après on semaine la pluie. Tout la peine ka y disparaît. Tout mal ka y jeri. Les moins mo, il kay passé, il kay passé, mais la vie ni pou kontinye. Merci. I think even if you don't um, understand Creole, um, sometimes, sometimes I, I listen to, to stuff in other languages too. And um, sometimes it doesn't even matter to me that I don't understand what they're saying. It's, it's just the, the flow and the feel and so on of it, you know. And um, what I was saying about the, 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 the deliberate choice that George Gordon made to write a certain type of Creole, that is also happening in this, you know. We are bilingual society and poetic tradition has to be unapologetically bilingual, you know? So I'm, I'm really, it's, 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 it's a knockout, it's wonderful to see persons taking on the, create, the, the task of, of you know, writing creatively um, at a good level in, in, in the other language that, that we possess. Before I go to the last point, I need to do something that I had meant to do early on um, after Robert's, um, after Robert's um, sharing with you. And, it is this, um, we, we're seeing, we, 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 we're getting spread before us a, a sense of the, the, the width and the variety and the richness and so on of the, the, the poetic tradition specifically um, in St. Lucia. Um, that poetic tradition is part of a wider literary tradition. And um, this, is, this is a good time and place, I uh, mentioned it earlier, um, to draw attention to the immense work on documenting St. Lucian writers, St. Lucian literature, um, which has been done by John Rockley. <laughs> the, the two um, bibliographies of St. Lucian literature covering poetry, prose fiction, and prose non-fiction, and drama, um, that persons can, you know, you can, you can search these to identify many other St. Lucian writers. You know? the, the second bibliography is titled very, very simply, St. Lucian's writing and, and St. Lucian writers and writing, and frankly, it's a national treasure. It really is. Um, there's another book that he dragged me, as his persons tend to do, into co-editing with him, um, St. Lucian Literature and, and Theatre. And that's a very, very useful collection um, of reviews covering more than 50 years of, um, of literature and theatre in St. Lucia. And looking at that, you can, you, 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 you can begin to get a sense of the growth and the development in St. Lucian literature and in theater, who were the persons, what were the trends, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, big respect to, to Robert for doing that kind of work. Um, the anthologies too, like um, St. C Poems and Art of St. Lucia, that includes work from Derek Walcott. Um, it's a very, very good comprehensive collection. And the other collections too, um, that he's been involved in um, directly or indirectly. A number of these works are available at the Cultural Development Foundation. And I would urge you to start harassing them and let them know that you know they have everything and you want copies of them. Thank you very much. Um, okay, it's time to bring on the, the last, um, last point. Um, so, again, I'll just let the world speak for itself and then just say one or two things briefly to wind up. Khadija Halliday. This is a poem about growing up with black skin. No, not brown skin, not fair skin, not the lightness belonging to a shabin. I'm talking dark, rich, melanated, glistening skin that ignited itself in the sun that in spite of me trying to inspire myself to overcome, I cannot expunge myself, loathing for it this is not a poem about self-love. This is a poem about the psychological displacement, self-hatred, which started in school with me witnessing 
Kids with skin the same color as mine get shredded by bullying whilst I stood by and did nothing. Out of terror of being identified as even uglier than I had already thought that I was, I had already been taught that I was, I did nothing. This is a poem about that time in third form that that girl looked me dead in the eyes as I walked past her. She said to me with the familiar conviction of a Pentecostal pastor, you, you look like a neg, retarded donkey. And I was merely walking to class. Do you see this is not a poem about growing up black. This is a poem about growing up with black skin, which is a different thing. This is a different thing. For me, it was everything as a kid. It was insecurity and insanity all at once. It was me quickly getting used to being the dark, ugly duckling in every friend setting. It was those same friends being terrified to look like me. It was my obsession with overpriced lightning creams. It was me giving up an entire tennis scholarship because sports would mean sun and sun would mean rays and rays would mean me risking more blackness. This is a poem about some serious pain. This is a poem about an immense amount of shame because I was immediately disqualified from unspoken beauty contests. Every time I entered a room, everyone else was always light enough to reflect whilst I could only glisten, listen. This is a poem about years of yearning to take a blade to my skin and scrape away. This is a poem about saving up to go to America because mommy once told me that in the winter my darkness could fade. This is a poem about rage at God because out of all palettes of paint, why? Why would he choose for me this shade? This is also a poem about change, about growth and introspection and interrogation and rejection of colonial indoctrination gazing into the television at my favorite characters, white boys with wavy blonde hair, whiter girls with straight brunette hair, asking, where am I? Where am I? Who am I? Why am I not represented on this screen, on this stage, in this, in this space, holding the TV, looking in, shaking it, asking, who am I? This is a poem about listening to my baby sister. Beautiful Carissa is her name. It means grace. Listening to her talk about the same bullying experiences, seeing similar familiar pain staining her adorable precious little face. This is a poem about me deciding then that this disgrace is enough. I will not stand for this any longer. My baby sister does not deserve to feel any inferior because of a skin color. Colorism is sick. This is a poem about revolt. And it took my little sister, yes, it did, looking up at me from a glorious dark-skinned face for me to begin posting my pictures in whatever shade the sun, the camera, the lens in your eyes decides to capture it. Capture this. Take out your phones and capture this because this is a poem that I never thought that I could perform. This is a poem about me reclaiming my Carissa, my grace. This is a poem about dark-skinned, hashtag melanin, hashtag Nubian queen, not being a mistake or a fad or a trend. This is a poem about a little dark-skinned girl, now a larger dark-skinned girl whose confidence is on the mend. This is a poem about dismantling the canonical ideology perpetuated in colonial history that darkness is synonymous with bad things and that goodness can only be packaged in light. I am good. I am dark and I am good. I am dark and there is lightness in me, not but, and. And there is darkness in me too. And lightness and darkness can all coexist. They do. I am living proof. This is a poem about a very personal emancipation story, obviously but one that belongs to many dark-skinned girls. This is a poem for black-skinned babies, black-skinned infants, black-skinned young ladies. You are beautiful and you are loved. Like I said, this is a poem about growing up with black skin. But this is 
also a poem about self-love. This is a poem about me finally feeling free to fall in love with the sun. For the last uh, 20 years or so, there's been uh, like a series of um, controlled explosions um, in the poetic tradition here. And those controlled explosions are uh, referred to as spoken word. Um, problematic term, I see a lot of discussions on this happen um, about it. Um, but and this is not, there's not a forum for it. Um, all I want to say is that we heard one of those, we just what we heard was one of those controlled explosions, and it was a big one. Um, when young people tell you that something is the bomb, you're talking about something like this. It's, it's interesting too that what, what is being explored um, is an identity question of race of belonging. It's interesting why? Because Derek Walcott, from early on, had to deal with that same thing, of race, of belonging. And he worked through to his own answers, um, which took him into this, this hugely important, significant idea of Caribbean civilization. Um, Khadija's path as far as I can judge, um, is a different one. She's speaking from her vantage point, her experience. But the thing is that the, 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 the issue is still here, still here, still having to be dealt with. It's a private issue, and it's a very public issue as well. Um, I don't know what else to say about it than that. This is just more than said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the for the bravery and the poetic craft and everything else that went into exploring it as, as we saw it happen there tonight. So, um, and the, the piece makes me want to you know, shout a big um, thank you and a, and, a, and a big up to, to the younger generation because it makes the future look bright, you know? <laughs> so, I and all our words, we, we've come to the outer edges of this choral bed of poetry and We've gotten, I hope, uh, a sense of you know, how rich, how varied, how, how beautiful, how dynamic, how constantly evolving this choral bed of, of, of poetry um, is. Um, for, it's an amazing tradition that we have here. It really is. For, for an island of you know, 238 square miles, um, it's, it's incredible. It really is. Um, I want to thank the organizers, the, the movers and the shakers, known and unknown, I um, mean, all their various capacities um, you know, on, on, the, on the village council, on the, on the events committee, um, you know, special mention of Bielia Francois who you know, um, inspired and slave drove when necessary persons to make all this happen. You know? so, um, and I want to thank you, I want to thank the poets, and I want to thank you, uh, because finally, um, even though some poets will tell you that family boys don't write for themselves, well, not you know, they write to share, you know. And I'm glad that you're here to share it and that you you're, you're receiving it in such a, a generous, warm spirit that, that I can feel, you know. So thank you. Um, so as we prepare to leave, um, I want to call on two of our ancestors to continue to help us grow this tradition in whatever ways we can, whether it's as appreciative audiences, as persons who are going to try to find the work um, in the books of CDF, and, so, um, and in the Dealers books, too, you know, um, whether it's that, whether us as poets and, and other writers to keep working on our craft and working on, on our inner and outer exploration, you know, I want to, yeah, I, I, I want to call on, on those two ancestors to help us to do this, because I say that interaction of, of, of Derek 
and its cultural heritage, which are symbolized in Sesen. You know, but that interaction of, of, of him, his poetic gift and craft, and the creative her the, the cultural heritage that he came from, which he was never ashamed of. You know. um, that's, that's the ground from which we grow. Um, so, Derek and Sesen welcomed us into this event, into this occasion, into this head and heart space. And I'm going to call on Derek and Sesen now to take us home. The wet leather reek of the hill donkey. Evening opens at a text of fireflies. In the mountains, Tikai beats a storm. Candles, candles, the black night bending <coughs> in its hard palms. Cool. Thin water. This is important water. Important? Imported? <laughs> water is important. Also, very important. The red rust drum. The evening, deep as coffee. The morning, powerful. Important coffee. The village shuts all day in the sun. In the empty school yard, teach a dead today. The food brought it yellow on the ground. Dyes from Gauguin. The Pomerad dyes. The earth purple. The ochre roads still waiting in the sun for my shadow. Oh, so you is Walker. You is Brady Brother. Is that Alexon? And the small, small rivers with the important, important names. And the important corporal in the country feature. Invitation, looking towards the thick green slopes of cocoa. The sun that melts the asphalt at noon. And the woman in the shade of the breadfruit bent over the leaf of the valley. Below her, two trees the lost, lost valley of sugar and rust. For the field of bananas, the tanker still rusts in the laguna grows old. Around what corner was uttered a single yellow leaf from the frangipani, a tough bark reticent, but when it flowers delivers hard lilies 
pungent, recalling Martina or Eunice or Lucilla, who comes down the steps with a cool side flow as spring water eases over shelves of rock. In some green ferny hole by the road in the mountains, a smile like the whole country. A smell of red, brown, earth. For armpits, for reaping, for arms, saplings. And all the women that she is now. With other generations of daughters flowing down the steps. Jean de Until their teeth go. And all the rest. Until their teeth go. 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 Until their Lucilla's I'm a wild golden apple that will burst with love of you and your men. Those I never told enough with my young poet's eyes, crazy with the country. Generations gone. Generations gone. When is the young see? Is there at all? No to say men. No to say men. Thank you.